If you believe that JK Rowling is the misunderstood victim of a witch hunt, then just say that. Make the argument you want to make. There is a power in objectivity, in there's a power in logic. Because it stands on its own two feet. That people seem to, when you cannot contend with logic, you kind of result to multiple tactics. Most common is to just neutral, to avoid the conversation to begin with is the easiest. Don't crouch and hide behind this disavowal, this obfuscating veil of just asking questions. Don't rely on innuendo and framing and lacrimose Gregorian chanting to make your point while coyly denying you have any kind of agenda beyond, I just believe in conversation. I don't know, I just find this a slippery and dishonest way to argue. But. If you happen to be a fan of slippery and dishonest arguments, you're in So right off the bat, we see that, that technique employed where objective questioning is discouraged and categorized as something to be shunned. Joe Rose transphobia. Joe Rowe compares trans activists to Death Eaters, the fictionalized fascists in Harry Potter. My position is that this activist movement... Okay, so she's not comparing all trans people. She's comparing a subset of activists. She just said the word activists and this... What's her name? Contra point? It's Contra is taking that statement and then saying that that applies to all trans people are death eaters, according to J.K. Rowling. In the form that it's currently taking, echoes the very thing that I was warning against in Harry Potter. So I do have to be very careful with my wording here, lest a defamation letter arrive by owl. J.K. Rowling's bigotry is exhausting to argue with because she expresses it as an endless series of what are called Mott and Bailey arguments. So a Mott and Bailey argument is when someone makes a provocative claim that's difficult to defend, the Bailey. And then, when confronted with counter-arguments, they walk it back to a much less controversial and easy to defend version of the claim, the Mott. For example, Rowling will make an ambiguous claim like sex is real. What does she mean by that? What are the implications? And virtually every argument sophisticated transphobes make about trans people follows this pattern. When arguments cannot withstand logical scrutiny, the, the first tactic, the easiest tactic, is to neutralize the conversation ha from happening. To then say, if you question any fundamental claim, any aspect of this claim, then you are automatically this extreme. So tonight, let's keep an eye out for that pattern. This is controversial, right? Calling trans women men who identify as women, calling trans men women. This is the Bailey in her Mott and Bailey argument. Trans women are men, trans men are women. That's the controversial interpretation of sex is real. Sex is real is a euphemism designed to present Maya Forstadter's transphobia as a simple statement of fact. Like, if this person doesn't think that trans women are men, trans men are women, is a transphobic statement, then what would they consider a transphobic statement? The illogical nature of this technique is that you can hold people to standard for words they have not actually even ever spoken. Another common tactic you'll see anytime Rowling's transphobia is discussed is you'll see someone jump in to say, show me one thing she's said that's transphobic. So when they say, show me an example of something transphobic JK Rowling has said, this is a trap. They're just messing with you. There's nothing that she could have said that they would acknowledge as transphobic. Now, if you're someone who believes that transphobia okay. is a valid concept and you believe that trans people are a legitimate minority, but you just genuinely are unaware of what JK Rowling has said on the topic, then I will refer you to my past video on JK Rowling's transphobia rather than recapping it all here. Just keep in mind that she's gotten significantly worse since I made that video. Are you gotta be kidding me. Why did you make a chapter called J.K. Rowling's transphobia? If you're just gonna 
15 minutes in, send me to another video to watch. <sighs> True, she never says the phrase, I hate trans people, because she's not a complete idiot. A world where we can convict people of things that they don't actually say because they're not that stupid to actually to actually do the thing that you're accusing them of, but they thought about it. They think that. I know they think it. I just can't prove it. But that's their intent. And so we're going to punish them all by their intent, not what they actually do. What J.K. Rowling does do is tweet again and again about transgender rapists. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. The penis individual who raped you is a woman. She's not saying all rape, all trans people are rapists. Again, it's the same technique. About the danger trans women pose to cis women. It's an interesting point that this individual will get to later about how facts obviously on their own cannot be transphobic or racist or anything. Facts are not anything subjective. They stand on their own. Rowling has also attacked pro-trans politician Nicola Sturgeon, calling her destroyer of women's rights via a t-shirt she got from anti-trans hate monger Posey they, Parker. Let's say you buy a t-shirt from a store and you take a picture in that t-shirt. You are now, according to this logic, you are responsible for every other shirt that that store sells, even though you didn't buy that shirt. I'm not gonna argue anymore about whether JK Rowling is transphobic because anyone who believes in transphobia can see that obviously she is. A, it's too exhausting for me to even be bothered because B, it's so obvious that C, everyone else can see it. It doesn't require proof. I'm not gonna argue anymore about whether JK Rowling is transphobic because anyone who believes in transphobia can see that obviously she is. This is often associated with when someone has a strong emotional presupposition that they cannot quite articulate or defend logically, you will often see when you start probing a bit, looking a bit closer, you'll get a re reaction similar to, it's so obvious that I'm just astounded that you would even require evidence or that you would even have to ask. I'm just, I'm not even gonna have this conversation. It's just too much. It's just, how could you even ask that? That's usually what we're talking about when we talk about JK Rowling, right? Whether it's fair to cancel her. We have to accept that realistically, persuading all the bigots is just not an option. Yes, we should convince as many people as possible, but there will always be bigots. And mocking them, shaming them, or boycotting them is, I think, a perfectly valid strategy. But the problem is, is that we're now shaming someone for a completely different definition. Because if you are considering someone to be a bigot, if they have nothing against someone being transgender, identifying however they want to, but they might have had some trauma in their past and feel a discomfort around male genitalia, and might be questioning the legal implications of this on their own rights. If that makes them a bigot, then um, that's quite a leap and to then be saying that they should be shamed for that. So keep that in mind as, as you're analyzing, as you are discussing how these people deserve to be shamed and why debate should be avoided rather than engaged in, because these are bigots we're talking about, so we don't need to reason with them. This kind of skepticism is in some ways a good impulse, but valuing dispassionate intellectualism above all else can cause problems, especially where topics of social justice are concerned. Because it can lead you to this kind of toxic centrism that asks, why are marginalized people so unwilling to have calm, 
philosophical debates about whether they should have rights. Are they afraid of dangerous ideas? I also can't help but notice that none of these civil conversations seem to change anyone's mind. Looking at that statement, do you think that that was the best way to phrase? No. Persuasion is more complicated and less rational than people think. Public debate is one way that we define the limits of the Overton window, the range of beliefs that are socially acceptable to hold. So often people who want to promote bigotry will use debate as a foot in the door. It's a way of establishing that their prejudices are within the realm of reasonable and socially accepted opinion. This kind of goes to my claim of I like to engage in conversations. I'm confident that bad ideas can be relatively easily disassembled, but you must engage with them to do so. It's better to have, let's say real, if there is a real Nazi, to have them come out into the light and to put forth their, their, their flag in the hill in the public discourse, in that Overton window, rather than do it in the shadows. So th by using those extreme examples to then argue against debate itself, rational debate, I would actually do the opposite. I would encourage you to think about it in the opposite way. Having the debate on a bigot's terms is not a good way to win people over, unless you're really skilled in the art of humiliating people, which most of the time is what public debate is actually about. It's not on their terms, it's not on your terms. It's meant to be objective. It's You have every opportunity that they have, so do not shy away from debate unless it's on your terms because by definition, it's then biased. True debate should be a meeting at the 50 yard line and it's on no one's terms. It's on simply the, the terms of truth and logic. And you can't be afraid of that. Before I move on, I do want to clarify that I do think there are trans issues that are legitimately debatable by people who are not bigots. By people that are not bigots, so again, that goes back to redefining the term of bigots, because that's going to knock out a large subset of people that want to engage in the debate, which might be convenient, but at least you're acknowledging that there are certain things that are worthy of debate, there are certain nuances. In my opinion, trans women and women's sports is one of those issues, but it's a complicated issue. Okay, so we're acknowledging there are nuances. Like, first of all, which sport are we talking about? Are we talking about figure skating? Middle school field hockey? Again, laws are not going to be applied sport by sport. It's another good example of how laws are universally applied. That's why we can't think about it like that. I see no reason why trans girls should be excluded from that. But if we're talking about professional weightlifting, well, then it seems plausible that trans women who have been through male puberty may still retain some kind of group advantage. But not all trans women have experienced male puberty. People are transitioning younger now, and that's another thing you have to consider. And that might be another thing that some people would like to discuss, and that does not make them a bigot. So I'm not against debating this issue, I just want people to approach it with nuance and good faith. We agree on that. Well, well look at that. Color me surprised. Thank you, ContraPoints, for... I'm glad we could end this on a note of agreement. Two hours? That must have taken you a lot of work, so props for that. Thank you for participating in the discourse and putting this out there. Regardless of any reactions you get, at least you're putting your voice out there. Like I said, meet. Don't be afraid of doing it on someone else's terms. Meet.